Um, David, do you want to respond to some of the things you've heard from Kate and Matthew, and then I'm going to immediately open it to... Yeah, to just, just one thing very quickly, both both um, Kate, Kate and Matthew are very uh, polite and complimentary, so I haven't got a whole lot to respond to. Uh, and actually, the one thing I'm going to say very briefly before opening it up is, is to agree with something that Matt just said, which is that although, although the stock of household debt in the UK <coughs> has fallen by a you know, fairly significant amount in the last few years. It remains a very large number. And of course, what's, what's unusual about the UK is that the great majority of the debt of the household sector, unlike in many other countries, is at variable <coughs> interest rates or flexible interest rates, so that when the central bank moves its interest rate, the rate of interest that people pay on their debt moves pretty quickly after it. I mean, sometimes there's a lag of a month or so, but it's not, I mean, we are not the US where the majority of people with mortgages have got mortgages with rates that are fixed for the length of the, of the mortgage, sometimes, you know, 30 years. So that when the Fed changes its interest rate, it doesn't affect the servicing cost of the debt for the great majority of households in the US. That's not where we are. So that does mean that you really do want to avoid a situation where the Bank of England feels it needs to raise interest rates really quickly, uh, which is why, you know, the, the the gradualness of the path back to a more normal level of bank rate, I think, is absolutely crucial and critical. And the, and the very good news, I think, about where we are in terms of inflation and where it looks like it's going, is that I hope, I very much hope, we can avoid what's happened many times in my life in past decades, which is you wait too long and then the Bank of England, you know, has to increase interest rates very sharply in a very short period of time because it's all got, you know, to use a terrible cliche, behind the curve. Um, and I think the good news about where we are right now is that I don't think that's where we are. And we can probably, probably, hopefully, afford a, a sort of gradual route back I just comment on that. I mean, you say that, um, I agree with you, of course, that we have a somewhat higher stock of uh, floating rate debt, although less so, it varies a bit, but you know, a bit less so than we did some, uh, a decade or so ago, that is means, that you, means that things react more quickly. In, in some ways, of course, that means that if you get into a situation you need to raise rates, you don't need to, it doesn't mean you don't need to raise them as much. I mean, I, yeah. I, I, a bit of a, I, always, I always struggle a bit with this, so I always struggle a bit with this, because in some ways, the fact that households respond when you raise yeah. rates is quite quite a nice control variable. And the other thing I wanted to say is partly in response to Matt and in response to you is that it's an implication in a way of your view, which I agree with, that um, the natural rate will be lower because of tight fiscal policy, that it means that in order to keep the economy going, households have to borrow more, mm -hmm. if you see what I mean. Because that's, you know, you're, you're, you're essentially... It's essentially a passing round of the, of the deficits. Is that, would you agree with that or, or not so much? Um, so the financial balances are in Well, of course, of course. Uh, households or firms, of course. Yeah, it's exactly. And I think one might hope, and there are reasons to hope, that it, w it might increasingly be firms rather than households. Um, I, it doesn't seem to be a great mystery why investment spending in the UK until very recently has been very weak. It hasn't been a driver of the recovery in spending that we've seen. That's because until very recently there's been a lot of slack in the UK economy. Yeah, now I think that is, that is diminishing yeah. at a pace now. Um, once you sort of use that up, I would expect investment actually to start rising quite strongly. So I think it'll be a bit, yeah. bit more investment, a bit less consumption driven recovery in the future. So on the carrot and stick of um, if we were to use macro prudential tools that restrict borrowing <coughs> for housing, would there then be a void which businesses fill through more investment, or do we also then need incentives and, and new regulations which actually encourage borrowing in that sector? Um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not, I'm yeah. not sure on that. I, I, I think that when, as I say, when you, when you look at the last three or four years where investment spending until very recently has been extremely subdued, I, I tend to view that as very much a natural response to an extraordinarily sharp downturn in 2009, um, then very little growth for a few years, the combination in which generate, for most firms, 
no desire to invest at all. Um, and then you start using up spare capacity and more and more firms are in a position where they need to at least replace stuff that's worn out. So I, I would view the very weak investment and the fact that the recovery to date has been more consumption driven and less investment driven as a kind of natural cyclical thing rather than here is some persistent problem with the way credit is allocated in the UK that means that you need to, either as a government or as a central bank, try and get inside the machine and start changing permanently the incentives to invest. Very quickly, Marion, because I want to throw it yeah, to the audience. I just want on, to one, throw one, in one another on. reason for investment being so weak, and that is um, the cost of labour. Yeah. 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 Which also yes, sir. Would you mind introducing yourselves? Yeah. Are you, some of you are known to me in the panel, and some of you are, 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 will not be known to everyone. Yeah. <coughs> William Claxton Smith. I couldn't agree more that one of the ways to avoid future crises is to get more equity into the banking system, and I'm very pleased with the start that's been made, and I think there's a long way to go. But one thing that does slightly concern me is that other financial institutions are getting drawn into the systemic risks debate, and you actually, in your slides, did say financial institutions, financial intermediaries, and I'm just wondering whether actually you really do think there is a concern in those other areas or whether you were just trying to avoid saying banks too often. <laughs> <laughs> um, a very brief response to that. I mean, I, 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 think, I think the comments I made, and indeed there's, there's a little appendix in, in, the, in the online version of this paper, um, very much are about banks, really. I think, I, I think you're right. It's, it's institutions that primarily fund themselves with debt, uh, and have assets that are a bit difficult to value. Um, and it's, it's there really that the problem was, you know, in 2008. So that's where you have to address it. I mean, if the FT on Monday is to be believed, pension funds are getting drawn into this argument, which it just seems to be bonkers, but yeah. I mean, yeah, and, and then you get into the question with the pension fund, well, is it DC or is it DB? And if it's DC, well, it's a different animal then, because if it's defined contribution, well, the, the assets and the liabilities just move in line. So it doesn't get into the same situation as a bank, which has got debt, and then the assets are actually. So I think you agree with me, it's banks that we're probably Banks it is. Other questions? Yes, sir. Yeah, Chris Bailey. Um, and the question actually is one that Marion asked, but I don't think David has answered it. You, you say that we're approaching the point at which we're going to raise, we ought to be raising interest rates. But what about QE? Should that be run off in, at the same pace? Or do you do interest rates first and then QE later? Mm -hmm. I mean, what, what sort of factors do you take in mind at that time? Um, I, I, th I think there's an argument for the first several steps in the normalisation of the stance of monetary policy being about bank rate. And only some ways down the road, thinking about the stock of assets. Um, part, part, part of the reason, part of the reason is this: that when we were buying the assets, what we would do is reach a decision as a committee. You know, the, what the majority wanted was then what was going <coughs> to happen, and you'd have a plan for what you might buy over the next three months or so, so that you could announce a series of auctions where we were <coughs> buying. And you give the auction dates and how much we were looking to buy and what kind of bonds we were going to buy on different auctions. So you told people kind of what you were going to do, which I think had, had some value in minimising the disruption of suddenly announcing an auction to buy a load of bonds. Okay. And there's an argument that that's how you might want to do it when you get to the stage of reversing it through sales. You would want to announce a... Uh, timetable for auctions. These would be more standard auctions where you're selling stuff rather than buying it. It's kind of like a reverse auction. But when you do it the other way, you might want to do the same thing. Um, but that would mean that you'd want to be fairly confident that you could follow a particular trajectory of sales over some extended period. Now, why is that relevant? I think it's relevant for the following reason. At the point at which you first start this road toward normalising monetary policy, you're never going to be quite sure whether you got it right. Maybe you've been premature. Um, and therefore, you could find that you, know, you do the first bit of tightening in monetary policy, and then you think, whoa, actually, you know, we, we've gone a bit too far. Something just happens, you get a bit of news from the international economy or something. Um, 
Now, if you, if you therefore use as your first line of normalization, let's start selling the assets, you could find yourself, okay, we're going to announce three, six months of asset mm -hmm. sales. One month in, you say, well, we're going to cancel, cancel it now because we need to slow it down. Um, I think it's easier to slow down or accelerate the process with bank rate. After all, people are more used to the fact that you, you know, make a decision one month and the next month you make another decision. So I think there's an argument, a slightly convoluted argument, but I think there's a logic to it, about using bank rate, if you like, as the first instrument in, along the path of normalization. There's another point, which is what does... What does the normal balance sheet of the Bank of England look like anyway when you get back to a more normal position? Well, so what have we done? We bought £375 billion of assets. That's matched almost uh, completely, not quite, but almost completely, by an increase in the reserve balances that the banking system holds at the Bank of England. So the Bank of England's balance sheet has gone up by a huge amount, about £375 billion. So that's an asset. Bank of England holds 275 billion pounds of UK government bonds. Asset side of the balance sheet goes up. How do you fund it? What's happening on the other side of the Bank of England's balance sheet? Well, there's a load of deposits of the banking system that sit with the Bank of England, which are much bigger than they were before the financial crisis. Why does this matter? Well, a question that the banks will have, the commercial banks will need to face is, what level of reserves do we want to hold in ordinary times in the future at the Bank of England? They used to hold a, very, a relatively small quantity of reserves, about 25 to 30 billion, which, <coughs> given the size of the balance sheet of the UK banks, was a tiny level of highly liquid assets of the Bank of England. Now, my guess is that the banks, having gone through a near-death experience, many of them, in 2008, where they weren't able to borrow from each other in the interbank market, would now conclude quite rationally, well, we can't rely on the interbank market always working perfectly. And therefore, if we need cash at short notice, it might not be such a bad idea to hold a much larger stock of reserves at the Bank of England than we used to. And the current rules of the game are that we, are, we in the bank are paying bank rate on all the reserves. Now, of course, bank rate is very low at the moment. It's half percent. But you know, it, won't, it won't be as you could add down the road in the future. And because we're paying bank rate on the level of reserves, it isn't obvious that we're penalizing banks for holding relatively <coughs> large quantities of reserves. Where's all this <coughs> argument going, you might say? We're talking about all these reserves at the central bank. So here's the punchline in a way. Let's suppose that the commercial banks between them decide that rather than the 25 billion they used to think was a sensible amount to hold the central bank, think that you know, 250 billion is the right answer. If that's what they conclude, then the Bank of England balance sheet, if we allow them to hold that level of reserves, and why wouldn't we, the balance sheet of the Bank of England is going to be bigger by the difference between those two numbers. And the question then for the Bank of England, it's not obviously just a question for the Monetary Policy Committee, but for a question for the Bank of England, is what assets do we want to hold against this much expanded quantity of reserves that the banking system wants to hold? And the answer to that might be, well, guilt. In which case, you would not want to run off or sell the whole of the 375 billion anyway. So it's a kind of long answer, but it's, it's interesting. Very interesting. Yeah. Interesting stuff. Um, yes, sir. Um, it's been suggested that um, with QE, the bank could buy different assets other than government bonds, yeah. say, to get infrastructure spending going, green infrastructure. I'm wondering what your view might be on that. Uh, well, you're right, you're right of course. Um, as it's turned out, the Bank of England has bought almost exclusively UK government bonds, virtually nothing of any other sort. Uh, and you might say, well, why are you doing that? What you're trying to do is encourage a recovery in spending in the private sector and encourage corporate spending. So why are you just buying government bonds? And the answer, and I, I think it makes some sense, was that the answer that I felt was a reasonable answer to that was this, that the nine of us on the Monetary Policy Committee, you know, Kate was there at the time uh, for, for, for much of it, um, 
we have no particular expertise in deciding, well, those corporate bonds we should buy because those are good companies, and these corporate bonds over here, well, we should avoid that because that's, that's a bit more risky. We didn't have any particular expertise in making those kind of credit allocation decisions. But there's plenty of people out there who do do that, and they sit in pension funds and um, you know, investment companies and people who run unit trusts, people who are investing um, you know, savings that people put into ISAs and hedge funds and sovereign wealth funds around the world. So you know, people who sit in those institutions, <coughs> and it's their job to make these credit allocation decisions. So I thought what we were doing uh, when we were buying gilts was not trying to help the UK government directly by bringing its cost of debt down. What we were doing is we were hoovering up UK government debt, sterling denominated UK government debt that was held in all these kinds of institutions, pension funds, insurance companies, sovereign wealth funds, hedge funds. And the people who sold the gilts to us would then get a cheque that we gave them. Well, they'd cash it and it would show up as bank deposits, but they didn't want to leave it in bank deposits because that was earning zilch, you know, virtually nothing. They would then look for a substitute asset to sterling long-dated government bonds, relatively long-dated government bonds that we had bought. And the closest substitutes might well be corporate bonds. So my view was that the way this was working, hopefully, was that the money would filter through to where we wanted it to get to, but, well, by, through this indirect route. Now, you might say, well, why, does, what, why did you believe that that was working? And my answer to that would be that the spread of corporate bond yields over UK government bonds, which, which had become enormous in the early part of 2009, then began a, 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 a steady march downwards. And so the cost of corporate debt for companies... Um, fell really rather rapidly. It certainly did that during the course of 2009, which is when we bought 200 billion, more than half of the total we eventually ended up buying. So my, my view was that if there were no signs at all that our buying gilts was getting through to the bits of the economy we were trying to get to, i.e. the corporate sector, and to some extent bringing down the cost of mortgage as well, if there was no sign that that was happening and all we were doing was bringing down gilt yields, then this would have been a failure, and we absolutely should have looked around and said, well, we've got to buy something else. Mm. But, but it seemed to me it was work. Transmission power. Put, put it another way, I, wouldn't, I mean, I think more simplistically, I mean, the, there may or may not be an argument for government to invest more in infrastructure and should have invested more in infrastructure, but I don't think that was something the Bank of England could and should have, should have done. I think that would have been a... I mean, that would, that would have been a different... It would have been something we wouldn't have, we wouldn't have wanted to do. Yeah, I, I, I suppose, coming yeah. back on that, by the way, my name's Chris Gordon Smith, I didn't mention earlier. But really, understand that. Obviously, the MPC probably isn't going to do resource yeah. allocation. I suppose the question I'm asking is, is there anything in principle that would rule out this kind of thing, saying, OK, we want this, uh, we want this to go somewhere else, but perhaps with somebody else doing the, the, the asset allocation? The green infrastructure bank or something. Well, I, I, I mean, I think it would, I, that's just not a job for the. I right. think the, the, the job of the bank really is around managing the economy and, right. and, and policy. I mean, if, if somebody else wants to do that, you it's know, it's a quasi political the, the, decision you know, the, or making the government, the government yes. through the, the treasury directly or through some scheme that sets up this. I think it's a very different. I think it's a very different thing. But I'm absolutely with David. I do not think it's for the Bank of England to sit about <coughs> making asset allocation decisions. Gentleman, the end there. Phil yeah. Hall. If you were to have your six years again, um, what do you wish you'd done differently? And uh, what perhaps do you wish your colleagues had done differently? I think I might put that to uh, b both the yeah, well, former yeah, MPC no. members as well and get uh, Matthew to give them a, a scorecard at the end. <laughs> so um, go ahead, Davis. Um, what would I have done differently? Um, I, yeah, well, that's why, I, the reason I'm hesitating is because it, it sounds like I think I've, I've done everything perfectly if I haven't come up, if I can't come up with an answer. You're going to be asked the next three see. months, so you uh, can bring your answer down. Um, <laughs> the TSC asked me this, I recall. I mean, I, well, I, let me tell you, I, I think we got quite a long, perhaps in retrospect, we took quite a long time to get to the, funding for lending scheme. 
which was, if you like, the other part of unconventional monetary policy. The asset purchases, you know, happened in big scale quite quickly, and it really wasn't for another, you know, three and a half years or so that the funding for lending scheme was launched. Um, now, partly that was because we weren't sure how effective, well, and Kate, Kate can give her own version of this as well, but, I mean, I, 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 it, was, it was difficult to work out quite how effective quantitative easing was being and whether it was getting through the parts of the economy. Even, you know, there were some encouraging signs. Um, and in retrospect, if we'd known, or if I had known back then uh, what we know now, I think it was a case for something like the funding for lending scheme being launched a little bit earlier. Um, and that came across in your chart when you saw the actual when the spreads came down much more much more yeah. sharply yeah. after the FLS was yeah. was was introduced. I'm I'm conscious that we would you like to say something, Marion, about what you your regrets at the NPC were, and also what you think David should be. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, a question for David. My regrets. Uh, well, hindsight's a wonderful thing. Um, well, I guess with hindsight, perhaps, and I mentioned that I'd um, been concerned about the interaction between monetary policy and financial stability while I was at the bank. Um, I left in 2005, so I can just about claim that my hands are clean, oh, but really? <laughs> perhaps I should have pressed harder on those issues and not just taken it as given that there were people out there that were looking at financial stability. I just started worrying about lending to other financial offices, corporations, um, at the time I left. But the remit of the MPC was very narrowly the inflation target, and it was 2.0% in the month I left. So probably that wasn't too and bad. But, so my regret isn't a monetary policy regret. It's really perhaps not spotty. The warning lights on financial stability. stability. And a very quick pricey or uh, uh, report on what David should have done better. Well, I just wonder, I mean, I've, I've commended him for sticking his neck out and being in a minority because I think that's absolutely what MPC members should be doing if that's what they believe. I just wonder with the way things have panned out. Where, and with the benefit of hindsight, whether he would would have voted again for that uh, the extra bit of cue that you voted for, David. Um, it's not a fair question, but you asked me to ask it. Well, well I mean, brief, what, brief, what, brief, what, what, whatever, you, what, what everyone point. says about QE, I don't think you could argue. I, and you wouldn't argue, but I don't think you could argue that if we if we'd done a bit more, we would have tipped over into hyperinflation, as people were saying at the time. I mean, where we've ended, of course, is zero inflation. Uh, Fine. Gavin, you want to come in here? Uh, well, it was actually unfit. I want to ask a question. I, 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 I sorry. Kate, 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 Brief. I think regard most of my time on the Monetary Policy Committee as a fantastic failure. I completely agree with Marion that we didn't think about financial stability anything like enough. I think we were entirely bound up by what I described earlier, which is obsession with the output gap. Um, and I don't think we asked. I don't think we really thought enough. We just didn't think enough. And you would agree with this, Marion. We didn't really talk about these wider questions. And no, as we a committee, did a bit, but we dismissed them. And as, think, as a committee, we were not, as a committee, we were not really encouraged to do so, and we did tend to dismiss them. So I thought I thought it was rather a failure. David's time, I think, has been much more, much more fruitful. Actually, the end of my time was really once we kind of got in, once we got a grip on these. So well, nothing's happened once since we got you grip, Once we got a grip, <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 it was one, one of the reasons we was much more. One of the reasons yeah. we did dismiss some of the increases in household indebtedness and so on, is a belief that monetary policy could step in and do something about it, which to I some extent you've argued yeah, is the case. I don't think it was I don't, far yeah. more disastrous than we I don't think it was household, I, I didn't think it was household debt. I'm sorry, we're going to, going to run over yes. all these oil <laughs> I still don't think it was household debt. I think our failure was to look at the financial system. Actually, we did look at household debt, that. but we did not look at the financial system. Sorry. Sorry, yeah, because that was somebody else's yeah. job. I, I yes, exactly. That's right. Yeah. But it's still a favourite. Maybe that was yeah. the problem. I, I want to um, get this wise group of people in front of me who, who are 
you know, economic policy makers par excellence to give us their their insight about overall macroeconomic policy and lessons. You're, you've all been involved in macroeconomic policy in different ways. Um, we have been through this extraordinary period, the likes of which none of us have ever seen before, um, uh, in terms of overall macro policy. Uh, I think David deserves credit. I hadn't seen before what you what you did, David, in terms of just having a punt at the impact on monetary policy of fiscal headwinds over the next few years. We all know it's an issue, but I hadn't actually seen someone transparently having a back at the end of go at putting a number on it. Um, just on that, by the way, it amazes me that by the end, by the time you're talking about we're big, on, on the current budget, we'll be in surplus. The overall surplus, was, we won't quite have hit overall surplus, but in terms of the current budget, we'll be in surplus, and it's still having that sort of almost 1% impact on interest rates. It's pretty significant. But my, my bigger question is, is what are your... I, I think Marion's absolutely right to, to worry that we are learning the, long rest, the, the wrong lessons about fiscal policy, um, and I suppose I want, bouncing off that, I want to know your take on the, the right sort of blend. What you, you, did we get the right blend between fiscal and monetary policy at different points since 2008? And if we have another crisis down the road, do you think we'll have learnt the right lessons or the wrong lessons from this period? I'm not asking you to sort of scorecard George Osborne, David, or in fact the Gordon Brown, um, but. Your job, you know, you do have an overall kind of role in macro policy. So I think talking about the balance between the two, and I'm sure Kate and Mary can do that too, and ha how how they played out over those years, and did we get the, the balance right? Um, what would you have done differently in terms of the balance? Is is it's just vital in terms of as learning the right lessons? Um, well, I'll be, I'll, I'll be very brief, and I'm just going to say something which, which I think was one of the points I was trying to bring out, which was that. Actually, the, the scope to use fiscal and monetary policy to deal with the aftermath of the mess, I think, was very, very substantial. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the fiscal deficit went up a great deal, um, and subsequent to that, I think the fiscal stabilisers have been allowed to, to work to a significant extent, and we did what we did on monetary policy. So I'm, I'm, not, I'm not so sure that the big lessons that we should take from this extraordinary episode are, gosh, we really need to make sure we've got even more scope to respond the next time it happens. As I said, I think the big message is, well, why don't we just try and reduce very substantially the probability that you get into a mess in the first place to which you do need to respond. And there, I think, I mean, the, the big mistake, I think, we made with the benefit of hindsight is that we thought it was perfectly reasonable to have big financial institutions, banks, let me call them what they are, <laughs> banks, uh, have leverage of 50, um, you know, two of equity, 98 of debt, on a stock of assets that nobody's entirely sure what they're worth. And that works fine when it works fine, and then when it goes wrong a bit, boy, does it go wrong. And I, see, I think that's the big lesson. And that's, the, and that's the road we've sort of been going down, Actually, that's, that has been the main response, I think, since. Do we okay, Marion? Well, I, 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 I was interested in Marion's view that, um, that we, we might be learning we should never borrow again in case we, you know, because politically people were worried that if they got tired of borrowing, they'd never be re-elected. I'm not, I'm not sure I'm quite as um, gloomy as that, because the electorate's ability to forget things fortunately is rather like a goldfish. So, <laughs> yeah, okay. uh, so, um, so, <laughs> you see what I see what I mean. If I think of all the, you know, things we, we've done that we've done, and then people have forgotten, you know, otherwise they wouldn't keep making the mistake of borrowing, pushing house prices up to, pushing okay. house prices up to. Up. So, I'm not, I'm not so worried about, I'm not so worried about that. But I think it's, but I, but I think you're, but I think it's an interesting thought. But I hope that, I mean, the previous government didn't really want to borrow all that money. It's just that when the crisis hit, they had to. Yeah, so, in, in, so in, in that sense, I think that's that's right. Now, Gavin's right, I think, asking a question, which I think is an interesting one, which is, you know, could fiscal policy have done a bit more? It's a very sort of, and it sort of relates a bit to the infrastructure question. And I suppose I have a slight tendency to think that fiscal policy could have done a bit more, but I think it's very marginal. And again, rather like, you know, whether or not Davies was right or wrong to vote for that bit more QE, it wouldn't really have made the big mm. difference. Basically, I think policy responded once the crisis, I think policy, of course, failed ahead of the crisis. Sure. Once the crisis started, I think policymakers did well. Some things you could have done faster. I agree with you. The FLS could have been done faster. But by and large, I think policymakers did reasonably well on the big decisions. 
Do you think that mm -hmm. argument has been won? Well, I mean, basically... Yeah, well, very much so. Well, yeah. well, I just wanted to say that I think in the... At the beginning of the crisis, I think policymakers, I think fiscal policymakers did the right thing. I think monetary policymakers were probably a bit slow off the mark. Um, and that predates your term, so it's not a criticism. I'm talking of, um, you know, end of 2008, the amount of liquidity provided and so on. Um, after that, I think there was too much onus placed on monetary policy and mm -hmm. fiscal policy um, backtracked too aggressively, which wasn't required for um, stability. And of course, you know, Kate's point about um, perhaps there's more scope for infrastructure spending and interest rates were very low. I think the important thing to have prevented a funding crisis, sterling crisis, and so on, um, around about 2010, 2011, um, was, a, was a credible commitment to a horizon for reigning in the deficit. It didn't need to be done so quickly. It was just important that the, um, the commitment was credible. And the comparisons with Greece, I think, were just a, a nonsense when uh, the governments yeah. issued um, debt in its own currency. Yeah, yeah. sorry. The, the, the point, I think, on the balance between fiscal and monetary as well is that, to some extent, with, with fiscal policy, you have government has more of a choice around who bears the pain. You can choose tax rises, you can choose cuts to benefits, you can cut public yeah. services. I think with monetary policy, it's, it's harder to have as, as, as clear a sight of the distribution <coughs> um, impact, I suppose. So something like quantitative easing, which props up asset prices, clearly um, helps to perpetuate wealth inequality. Mm -hmm. And I think monetary policy was and is being asked to do too much of the work, given where the burden of that policy lies. Now, do you think that, that the argument has been settled now? Because you saw the Chancellor there saying we're going to press on. He mollified it a little bit. The roller coaster got a bit smoothed out. But some people, you know, people like Paul Crookham and Larry Summers have been saying, you know, go and borrow £200 billion pounds and invest it in infrastructure, rewire the whole country. Um, you know, that, that argument has been lost. I think, I think Marion's right that the, the, the political and electoral right. fallout yes. from all of this yeah. is, is simply that governments or political parties now know that they have to speak to them. Okay, I'd like to wrap up, if I may, uh, and I'd like to thank David, Marion, Kate, and Matthew. Um, just as a large show of hands, I think that we've had saying that, you know, both Mark Carney and David today saying the uh, time is at hand or drawing near for a normalisation of interest policy. And I think that what I also heard you saying is if you want to be gradual, it's better to start early. Does that mean the time is now? People in the audience, is the time now, or the next month? No, as in August. Sorry? As the next vote. Yes, the next <laughs> vote. Anyone who thinks that should be yes? If you, you're an MPC member for a day. Yes? I'm not putting my hand up. BBC has no views. <laughs> <laughs> no, not a single one. So, ah, oh, there we are. One over there. Over there. David, I don't suppose you'd like to give me a headline for tomorrow. Oh, like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I will wait till I actually vote. <laughs> <laughs> On that, David, Marion, Kate, and Matthew, and Gavin, for our, as our host, thank you all very much indeed for coming. Thank you. Thank you.